two and four, just reverse it. One, two and four, and one sixteen. Are you are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Thank you, baby.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you this morning, and I'm thankful that you have come to the house of the Lord here at, at Post Oak Presbyterian Church to worship our great God with us. And it's a beautiful day that our, our Lord has blessed us with. We've had a few days, a little reprieve from uh, the hot weather we've had. I, I think it's been hot. Honestly, it's 2020. I don't know what it's been. So, but I, I think it's uh, a little cooler, maybe, than what it has been. Uh, the last few weeks. So we're thankful for that. I know I, I see some, some folks posting on social media that they're ready for the fall weather. So uh, fall is a it's, a, it's a fun time of the year. I do love autumn. It's when God just seems to display His handiwork in the trees and, and all across our, our country. Just beautiful time of, of year. So we're, we're anticipating that, but uh, we're continuing to remain faithful day by day, doing what our God has called us to do today, and not thinking too far ahead, but recognizing that God has a purpose for us this very day. I was, I was listening this morning as I was preparing my heart to come worship God. I was listening to a sermon, and, and God never fails to speak to us when we come to His Word and, and hear it with attentive ears. And um, the, the, the minister talked about Psalm 23, and how when we come together to worship the Lord, our great God, He comes before us, and He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And today, our enemies are, are vigilant. They, they seek to destroy us uh, at every hand and on every hand and it, with every cause. And sometimes it feels like we're standing alone in the world. But our Jesus is here with us. And He has given us His Spirit. We never stand alone. Ever. With God. If God be for us, who can be against us? Remember that. We're never in the minority. Never even though it feels like it. I'm so thankful to have a Savior this morning. And that's why we're here. We're here to worship Him. And our great God calls us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. So grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear Him call us to worship Him from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and, and not we ourselves. We are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. We could just, I could just go preaching right here, right? Because this whole thing is about the Lord. The call to worship Him. The call to come before Him. And our duties there are right before us. And, and if we don't get out of worship what we think we should get out of worship, it's not the Lord's fault. It's not the church's fault. More than likely, it's not the minister's fault. It's our own fault. Because here is our call to worship Him and, and be obedient to these commands. And I just love to worship with, with the people of God and to be in the house of the Lord together. So let us publicly respond to God calling us to worship from Psalm 124 and verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Let us bow for prayer this morning. Our great God in heaven, we are so thankful to have the freedom to come to this church house this morning with the saints of God and worship You. To make a joyful noise to You. To serve You with, with gladness. Not being constrained not being forced to serve You. Not feeling like we have to do this. 
but being glad. What makes our hearts glad this morning? And it should be coming before you and serving you with gladness and singing to you, not to ourselves, but singing to you, knowing that you are God. We are not God. We have not made ourselves. You have made us. We are, we are your people. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. We are the sheep of your pasture. Help us, O oh God, to remember these truths, to have hearts filled with thanksgiving, to know that we are not alone. If God be for us, who can be against us? Though, though uh, suffering and, and death and, 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 and pain and sickness and trials and tribulations and viruses may come, nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let us be thankful to you and bless your name, God, because you are good, because your mercy is everlasting and your truth indeed endures to all generations. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our scriptural call to confession of faith comes from the second epistle of John. Second John and the verse number 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. There's a difference between the world and the people of God. We as the people of God confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. We confess so many other things from the truth of God's Word, but John chose to point that out there in 2 John 7, that Christ has come in the flesh, and those that do not confess that are deceivers, and antichrists. So we're thankful to be able to gather together with the people of God this morning and confess our faith together. We'll begin doing that on the front of your bulletin in Westminster Shorter Catechism question 88. If you'll take a moment and read over that and then we'll confess together. Westminster Shorter Catechism question and answer number 88. I ask you, dear church, what are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption are His ordinances, especially the Word, sacraments, and prayer, all which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. I saw, you know, I put a strong emphasis on all of those things, the word, the sacraments, the prayer and prayer as we gather together. And, and that's why, because those are what are made effectual to the elect for salvation. On the back of your bulletin, we see Heidelberg Catechism question and answer number 88. Take just a quick moment and read over that and we'll confess together. I ask you, dear church, of how many parts does the true conversion of man consist? Of two parts, of the mortification of the old man and the quickening of the new man. And when, when Christ's Spirit gives us a new heart, He, he makes us new. We're new creatures in Christ. And we, have that, we, we now have His Spirit to mortify our flesh, the old man, the things that would... Um, stand against the things of, of Christ. So we're so very grateful for that. We come now to the Apostles' Creed. And the thing when we confess the Apostles' Creed, it's easy just to read something. But the Lord knows our hearts. And He knows whether this is true in our hearts as we confess these things. So we're all sinful. We're all weak. There's times when it's, it's more true than others in our lives. But as we come to God as humble sinners confessing our faith in Him, May these words be true in our heart that flow from our lips. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in a holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's, it's kind of like a cool drink of water to confess these truths that we believe about um, God and, and His Word and His Son and His Spirit. It's a, it's a blessing to be able to confess these things together. Now, as we've confessed our faith, let us now come to a time silent confession of individual sin. We're scripturally called to do so all through God's Word, but in particular we see in, in 1 John 3, 4 this morning, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. We've all done it. Let us confess to our great God this morning, the God who shows us mercy. We're called to confess from 1 John 3, 4. And then the very next verse, I believe, shows us a God's covenant assurance of pardon to our hearts. And you know that Jesus was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, let us continue to praise the Lord as we sing to Him this morning. Let us remember that He comes before us in the presence of our enemies, preparing a table for us. First Tim is 247. Once again, we're going to do three verses. One, two, and four. 247. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with His hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with His hand. When clothed in His brightness transported I rise to meet Him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers 
shoulders be there with his hand. Amen. The next hymn is 352. 352. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, I have a Savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. I'm very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. I'm very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Amen. There's nothing quite like having that anchor for our soul the Lord Jesus Christ, our solid rock. Amen. Let's lift up our voices and sing the doxology to our great God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You that we can praise Your name this morning. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We thank You that we do have that hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. That which has entered into the veil for us, our forerunner, the Lord Jesus Christ, made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And even now we can come before the throne of grace. We can come to the throne of grace with our petitions, making known our request to our great God, because Jesus Christ is indeed our faithful and merciful high priest who intercedes on our behalf. And we can find grace to help. We can find mercy in time of need. Oh Lord, we thank You for that. I thank You for these, Your dear and precious saints that have come to the house of the Lord this morning to worship You, 
May our worship be sweet in your presence. Be with our, our dear loved ones who are not here with us today for a variety of reasons. We have some traveling, some that are watching uh, the, the video later on. We have uh, some, God, who are not well, some who are sick, some who are struggling, some who are discouraged, Father. Be with your people, God. Encourage, help them to find their encouragement in the Lord. In you, there is no hope in this world. There's no encouragement in life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, O oh God, to think your thoughts after you. I pray this morning as the Word of God is proclaimed that our minds would be instructed, our hearts would be ignited, our wills would be invited to follow after You. And I pray that You would help me as Your minister to present Christ the Savior as the one needful thing in the lives of desperate sinners. God, I pray for all the churches across this country this morning that are faithfully proclaiming the truth of Your Word. Give those ministers the courage and the boldness to proclaim and declare Your Word, Father. Pray the people would hear with attentive ears and hearts that are willing to follow You. We thank You for the good news this week, this past week of... The church there in California, Pastor MacArthur and his congregation, they, they had a ruling in their favor, God. And, and Lord, we just praise you for that, Amen. that it is not wrong for them to meet. We know it's not wrong, but what a blessing when, when it's uh, uh, declared by our civil government. What a blessing, God. Often we focus, or I know I'm, I'm guilty of focusing on the negative, and Lord, I just want to praise you for the positives, Lord, and, and for the blessings that you give us throughout each and every day that we live. You are such a great God, and we love you, and we praise your name. Give us what we need this morning for our souls. Thank you for teaching us. You've even taught us to pray using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our scripture text um, is not Acts 4. We'll get back there, Lord willing. But based upon last week's sermon, I was compelled to come to Proverbs 28 and verse 13 as my text this morning. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. Hear now the word of our great God. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. The grass withers, the flower fades, but this, the word of our great God, will abide forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. All right, uh, do we have any praise reports this morning? It's good to be back, of course, uh, after a little hike up in the mountains last weekend. Any praise reports this morning? Yes. I have a praise and um, a request. Um, we are now great-grandparents, um, but it was prematurely, and Mommy is still in an um, induced coma, a medically induced coma, so she doesn't even know she's had her baby yet. So the baby was transferred two hours away from where mommy and daddy are. So um, she was three pounds and eight ounces. And so she, uh, her name's Annie Barnhart, and her mommy is Eden, and her daddy is Reagan. Praise reports that you'd like to share with the congregation. 
I was telling Ryan about it, well, that Mary had points of surgery this past weekend. Uh, Lance will say it's, it's well, not anything serious. Amen. You can be treated. Amen. Amen for that. Thank you for that update on Miss McGill. Thank you for update on that. Any others this morning before we get into our prayer list? All right. If there's no other praise reports, let's look at our prayer concerns. Obviously, we've got a few updates here that we've lost. Uh, from the prayer list, so we'll move those. But are there any other updates on this prayer list that I may have missed in the few weeks I've been out here and there lately? Um, did you add, I don't, yes, you did. Cindy Woody, right. Yes, we did. Thanks, Adam. And Cindy still waiting on? A doctor's appointment, correct. And um, there's a couple more on here. A, a, a good friend, my high school, one of my high school buddies, his son passed away this week. He, he was 19. Uh, the funeral's today. Named Ethan Way uh, mm -hmm. is the son. My, my good friend is Jimmy. Somebody from Monterey might know Eddie and Betty. Eddie's a preacher up there. And uh, just remember that family as they deal with that uh, this weekend. Or in the coming months, it's going to be a long time. There's a lot of questions still about it, so I don't know. Any others this morning? Oh, Winnie Heyman, Twelve Sister, yeah, passed away. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah we, it was uh, one of my errors there. Many errors. Any others this morning that I, on the prayer list? You can give me updates. You can do whatever you want to do right here. Let's. I'm thankful. I'm, I'm advocate of the of children return to school. I'm a strong force. Mm. So let's pray that they will be protected. Amen. And God's hand be upon them and they'll avoid illness and uh, be able to go on with their studies. Amen. Yeah, yeah we, we we pray every day for normal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whatever that looks like. We're not sure right now, but we're definitely praying for it. We want those kids to stay healthy. Of course, I'm concerned there's no new normal. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, any others this morning? All right, if there's no others, let's bow our head. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the many blessings. Thankful to be here in the house of the Lord. We just, we love you. We, we thank you for the praise report for young Annie, Lord. We ask that you'll be with her as she grows into health. Be with the mother and work her back to service. You're the great physician. Uh, Lord, we thank you for... Uh, the update on Miss McGill this morning. We ask that you'll be with the physicians as they make plans ahead, uh, that they that you will heal her back to your service, Lord. We need all the prayer warriors that we can have here on this planet, Lord. And we just ask that you'll continue to heal those people. Lord, we ask that you'll be with these people who are not here today, the people who have, are at home who are watching our videos, who are praying for us, and that you'll get them back here. Lord, let's get back to normal. Uh, here on this planet. Let's get back to doing the business that you have sent us here for. Lord, we ask that you'll be with us throughout the service. Continue to be with us throughout the weeks. Be with these children. Lord, and we just love you. Thank you for everything. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. Well, people often say that the cover-up is worse than the crime. Recently, a professional baseball player was suspended 50 games for testing positive for testosterone. And basically, if you're a professional athlete, you're not allowed to put anything into your body that gives you an advantage over others. But instead of just taking the 50-game suspension, the team he is a part of went and created a phony website and said that this player ordered this supplement from this phony website and he was deceived by the, by the company and it was actually the team that created the website. They tried to play it off like the player didn't know that this supplement had testosterone in it. And they even got so intricate in their detail that they, they, they sent one of their employees 
to his desk or her desk to create this phony website. Now that may be a breeze for these kids nowadays to do that, but it seems like it wouldn't be easy. Basically, that seems like a lot of work to cover up a wrong, doesn't it? Let me ask you a, a question. You all are a bright audience and you're capable of thinking logically. So, do you think this cover-up worked? Of course it didn't work. It was, it was rather easy to see right through this. So what wound up happening is the player and the team looked even more ridiculous and it would have served them well to have just confessed the crime and served the suspension. You would think that politicians and athletes and celebrities would learn their lessons about covering up their wicked deeds. But time and time again, we read of these kind of cover-ups. I don't know if it's because they're so rich and famous that they think they're above the law or, or what it is, but they just keep trying to get away with their sins by covering them up. But then I come to Proverbs 28.13. And I'm reminded of my own heart. So many of these people that got, get caught in these crimes that try to cover them up, they're, they're unregenerate. They, they're without the Lord. They're without His Holy Spirit. They're just trying to keep their wrong from coming out in the open so humans won't think worse of them. Yet how often do we as Christians not only cover up our sins from others, but we try to cover up our sins from God Almighty. And if humans are smart enough to see right through a fake website scheme to cover up a, a wrong, how do you think God feels? What do you think God, the omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, and omnipresent everywhere, what do you think God thinks when we try to cover up our sin from Him? Do we really believe? Do we really believe we're going to pull the wool over God's eyes? Perish that thought. Perish that thought. There are two clauses in our text this morning, and I want us to examine them, and I had every full intention of preaching on both of those clauses this morning. But you'll be thankful that I chose to split them up into two, because this first one I just kept studying and kept getting more and more information on it. So we're just going to take the first one this week and look at, Lord willing, the next one next Lord's Day. There, but there are two clauses in our text. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. That's the first clause. The second clause, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Let's take that first clause this morning. I, again, as I mentioned before I read the text, I, I felt really compelled to come to Proverbs 28, 13 as, as my text this morning after preaching on Peter's sermon from Acts 3 last week. The reason why is because I really want us to, to see the importance of God's Holy Spirit probing our hearts, convicting our hearts, calling our hearts to repent, repentance through the preached Word of God. And Proverbs 28 and verse 13 is a great reminder of why that's important. Because the worst possible thing we could do is try to cover our sins. Our text clearly and plainly states, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Three things about this clause I want us to see this morning. First, the ways we cover our sin. And we'll spend the majority of our time here. Second, why we cover our sin. And third, the warning against covering our sin. The ways we cover our sin, why we cover our sin, and the warning against covering our sin. How then do we cover our sins? What are the ways that we cover our sins? There are many such ways, many ways, but I've chosen to touch on three. Three ways we try to cover our sins, and, and I hope that this will reveal to us by God's Spirit the dangers of doing so. The first way is this. We try to hide our sin. We just try to hide it. Now, I married a 
a beautiful woman. And I'm allowed to say that. You're not, okay? <laughs> but you can say it. I'm just kidding. But she doesn't, she doesn't wear a lot of makeup. And I want you to know I'm thankful for that because honestly, I just I love her natural beauty. And I'm not even going to look at her because she's probably giving me a dirty look right now. But the purpose of the makeup, right? What is the purpose of makeup? It's, it's to hide what, what ladies think are blemishes. The purpose of makeup is often to conceal. That's why one of, uh, 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 an actual specific makeup item is called what? Concealer, right? And is that not what we do so often with our sin? We hide it, we conceal it. That's the whole premise behind covering something up. We don't want our sins. We don't want people to see our blemishes. We don't, we want, we don't want our faults to be out in the open, so we, we, we hide them. There are biblical precedents for this. David is the one who immediately came to mind. 2 Samuel 11 tells us that it was time for the kings to go forth to battle, but David tarried behind in Jerusalem. Of course, we know what happened. David went out on his, on his uh, roof in the evening. He saw a woman bathing. He inquired of her, found out that she was Bathsheba the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And then David made the gravest mistake of his life by committing adultery with this woman. And the thing of it is, is this was done behind closed doors. Away from others. Now I thought about that and I thought, you know, David's the king. He's bringing this beautiful woman into his, into his palace. Wouldn't some of his... Wouldn't some of his men, wouldn't some of his court think, hmm, that's strange. What, what's happening behind those closed doors? But then this morning, it, it dawned on me, you would hope they wouldn't have thought the worst because they would have thought that David had more integrity than that in his heart. But in this incredible moment of weakness, he did not and he massively sinned and Dear church, that is why it is so important to, to be vigilant in this spiritual battle that we're in every day. To not fall asleep in this spiritual battle that we're in every day. To be awake, to be alert, because the enemy is. And the enemy wants to destroy us. And he wants to destroy anything that has to do with the name of the Lord. And it is our duty to put on the whole armor of God every day. To be vigilant in this battle. And David wasn't on this day. And I don't know if those within his court thought something was going on in private. But here's what I do know. David did this in the presence of God. Growing up, Proverbs 15.3 was probably my favorite Bible verse it's a very simple Bible verse. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Nothing is hidden from God. Nothing is concealed from God, church. Not one thought, not one word, not one glance of the eyes, not one action can be hidden from God. And you know who knew this? David knew this. His son actually wrote Proverbs 15 verse 3. So David evidently taught his son these truths. But on this day, on this particular day, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the desires of sin overpowered him. And the story sadly doesn't end there. Bathsheba came back to David months later and said, I'm, I'm pregnant with your child. David got nervous. He sent a message to Joab, the captain of his army, to have Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, sent home. Uriah came home. David was scheming a plan to have Uriah go home to be with his wife. And of course, he'd been away from her a while. So as adults, we understand what would happen there. And then Uriah would think that would be his child. But Uriah was more honorable than this. And he said, if my fellow soldiers are in battle and can't have relations with their wife right now, I won't either. 
David went so far as to get Uriah drunk to try to get him to go home to his wife. And even in his drunken stupor, Uriah had more honor than that. You see, David's plan wasn't working. He was trying to cover his sin. He was trying to hide his sin with this scheme, with this plan. And it wasn't working, so he sent him back to battle. He sent Uriah back to battle, but he sent a letter with him. And in this letter to Joab, David wrote that Joab was to have Uriah placed at the most heated battle, at the front of the battle, so that he would be killed. Do, do, you, do you know what's amazing about that? David sent the letter with Uriah because he knew Uriah was a man of integrity and he wouldn't just ride on out of there and open up that letter and read it himself. That's how honorable Uriah was. And this, is, this must have surely been how David's men thought of him and, and why they may not have really believed what was happening behind closed doors. But be sure your sin will find you out is a principle taught all through Scripture. What we think is concealed eventually comes out. And sadly, it does harm not just to us, but it does harm to others. Are we listening to what's recorded here in Scripture as I, as I give, give this narrative? It's, it's like a plot from a soap opera. Or well, Uriah died in battle. That was the next step of, of the plan, and it worked. And Joab sent word back to David that Uriah was killed in battle. And you know how David replied? This, this always stuns me to read David's reply. David said to Joab, don't let this thing displease you. After all, men die. It is war. That's stunning. Coming from the king. Sir Walter Scott, this is often mistaken for a Shakespeare quote, but it, was, it came from Sir Walter Scott. He wrote, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first we practice to deceive. David tried to hide it all, but you know who he wasn't hiding it from? 2 Samuel 11.27 says, it's a very chilling verse, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. He thought he was getting off scot-free. He thought Uriah is dead. I don't have anything to worry about. This is over. But the thing that David had done recorded in Scripture said, it displeased the Lord. Dear friends, we can try and hide and conceal our sin from everyone around us, but the Lord knows. And when we sin against the Lord, it displeases Him. And there's no amount of covering that can change that. None. It's kind of like being out in the middle of a horrible rainstorm. You can put on all kinds of layers. You can even put on a, a waterproof, you know, I'm doing air quotes, waterproof rain jacket, but you're still going to get wet. You're, and if, it, if the rainstorm is bad enough, you're going to get soaking wet. God, the one we will give an account to one day, sees all that we do, and we cannot hide anything from Him. It's many layers of hiding as we try to put on. Be sure our sin will find us out. And there, there of course, are other case studies in the Bible on this. If David trying to hide his sin the way he did doesn't first come to our minds, and perhaps Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden does. They tried to hide from God and tried to cover their sin with their own sowings of fig leaves. You simply cannot do that. Not only do we try to cover sin by hiding it from God and others, but we also try to cover our sin by excusing it. Giving it a different name. Giving it a different title to make it sound not quite as bad as God's Word makes it sound. You know, this is a trick of the world. This is what the world does. They, they, they call sexual perversion love. They call the slaughtering of, of babies in the womb reproductive rights. And we recoil in horror as God's people at the thought of excusing these sins. But how often, how often do we as believers do the same thing with our own besetting sins? Saying things like, well, God doesn't expect me to be perfect. Saying things like, well, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I know it's not what I should be doing or what I shouldn't 
be doing, but it's not that big of a deal. Please hear me. We are attempting to excuse that for which God poured out His wrath upon His Son at Calvary. In our place. Does God think it's not that big of a deal? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says in Galatians 5.17 that the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these two are contrary to one another. Does that sound like something that God would just give us a free pass on? He says the flesh, the sinful desires are contrary. Totally opposite. From the things of the Spirit. Like it's no big deal when His Son suffered the way that He did to put to death the lusts of the flesh. Dear church, we never have a right to excuse our pet sins or we never have a right to say, well, God can't expect us to be perfect. It's a dangerous game when we, pl- we play when we try to excuse our sins. We gather together as the saints of God. We gather together this morning as Christians. Do we understand what we're saying when we call ourselves Christians? We're saying that we believe we are sinners. We're saying that we believe that Christ suffered the eternal punishment of the wrath of God for us as sinners. Because of our sin, not His. It was our sin. We're saying that we believe that we deserve the wrath of God because of our sin. When we call ourselves Christians, we say that Jesus is our representative. Jesus is our surety. Jesus is our substitute. Jesus is our Redeemer. And that He took that punishment in our stead. And if we call ourselves Christians and we believe that and by faith we cast ourselves completely on Christ and His finished work, and we rely upon nothing that we can do, that is what the gospel is. That's how the gospel is taught in Scripture. That's why we call ourselves Christians. And you must believe these things to be true if you call yourself a Christian this morning. And if we call ourselves Christians, how could we ever excuse the sin It caused our Lord the unspeakable anguish and pain and suffering that it did. How could we ever say, well, you know, God doesn't expect me to be perfect when God punished His perfect Son in our stead? In the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord was in an anguish. The Bible says he was sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. Why? Because of the horrors of Calvary. Because he understood that he was about to be declared a sinner. The sinless one who is holy perfection, holy pure, looked upon by the Father as a vile and wretched sinner in my place because of my sin forsaken and condemned because of my sin. And I dare want to play a game of excusing sin? God forbid. If you're looking for a case study of excusing sin in Scripture by taking it lightly, look no further than when Moses was on the mount and he was receiving the tables of the law from the mouth of the Lord. Do you remember what was going on down below? The Israelites were camping down below the mount. In Exodus 32, you can read that later this afternoon. It explains the situation in detail. Basically, the people came to Aaron and and said, we don't know what's happened to this man called Moses, so Aaron, make us gods that can lead us from now on. Now, you would think Aaron would have put up a little fight there, but we read of none recorded in Scripture. He simply said, give me all your gold, And he made a molten calf. And then he said to the people of Israel, these are your gods that have brought you out of Egypt. That's stunning. See what Aaron just did? He likened the calf. He likened the the image of God to a corruptible image. And they said, we're going to make a feast to the Lord. And we're going to worship this calf at the feast to the Lord. 
And they did that very thing. The, the very next day, they had a pagan feast and they declared it in the name of the Lord. And that's why, that's why it's so important that we regulate, we allow God's Word to regulate our worship. Because Aaron said, this is done in the name of the Lord. What can be wrong? Of course, if Scripture doesn't regulate worship, then it is a, it's a free-for-all. It's anything goes, as Exodus 32 shows us. Well, guess who knew what was going on? Just like he knew what was going on with David, the Lord did. And he told Moses to go down and deal with those stiff-necked people. That's what he called them, the stiff-necked people. Moses interceded to God on behalf of the people and he went down the mountain and, and he, got the, he got the update from Joshua and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a pretty update. He came to the camp, Moses came to the camp and he saw the calf and he saw the dancing and the godless pagan rituals that were being participated in. And the Bible says that Moses got so angry that he broke the tablets and burned the calf and made the people drink the powdered water. Hmm. Then Moses came to Aaron. So what in the world are you doing? And then the excuses began. Aaron said, well, Moses, you, you were taking an awfully long time on the mountain. You've got to admit, Moses, we didn't expect you to be gone so long. And so then the people came to me, and we didn't know if you were dead or what was going on, and the people needed some, some new leadership, and I, I was afraid, so I just threw the gold into the fire, and boom, out came this calf. And then everybody decided to get naked and start having this pagan feast. Aaron, are you kidding me? That had to be what Moses said. Are you kidding me? Just stop. Just stop with the excuses. It's not covering up anything. If anything, it's making matters worse. Trying to cover our sin by making excuses for our sinning. And our sin has only ever made things worse. And this kind of goes back to my opening illustration where people say the cover-up is worse than the crime. Now when taken to its logical conclusion, we know that's not true. But trying to cover up our sins with excuses can only make things worse.